12 o'clock. This is Kyra Mann, CEO of Mito Action, and we are excited to have you with us today for our um, October Mito Monthly Expert Series. Um, just a few reminders and housekeeping items before we start. Today's call will be recorded and will be available on the Mito Action website um, by end of day tomorrow, within 24 hours. Usually we will get it up. Um, so we hope that you'll find today's presentation useful as you're navigating your journey with mitochondrial disease and FAOD. Um, MitoAction's excited to share, we'll be releasing more content and program opportunities to support the FAOD community. So I encourage you to check back to our website and social media for more details um, as we're kicking that, that content and those programs off. So we're excited to you know, expand the ways that we're supporting the FAOD community. Um, so we are excited today to have Dr. Jerry Vockley join us. Um, as you know, just again, I just want to give us a couple housekeeping. If you want to ask a question, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your window and send that over to us. Or if you're listening audio wise, if you can send that via email to info at mitoaction.org and we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. Um, today is October 4th, um, and we have Dr. Jerry Vockley from the Children's Hospital at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Dr. Vockley is internationally recognized as a leader in the field of inborn errors of metabol metabolism and fatty acid oxidation disorders research. His lab has been responsible for identifying multiple new disorders since 2000, many of them defects in mitochondrial energy metabolism, and he has published over 200 scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals. His current research focuses on the molecular architecture of mitochondrial energy metabolism, in which he is breaking new ground in describing the roles of dysfunction of mitochondri mitochondrial energy metabolism in such common conditions as diabetes, obesity, and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Vockley has served on numerous national and international scientific boards, and he speaks at multiple family support functions throughout the year. Dr. Vockley is the founder of the International Network for Fatty Acid Oxidation Research and Management, otherwise known as INFORM, to promote research and dis discussion into the cause, diagnosis, and management of FAOD. INFORM offers several learning opportunities throughout the year for patients, families, and researchers. The INFORM network will provide a collaborative framework for ongoing communication and research regarding these disorders, as well as sponsoring a, suppose, a symposium each year. You can learn more about INFORM at informnetwork.org. Dr. Vockley is the co-founder and editor of the North American Metabolic Academy established by the SIMD to help educate the next generation of metabolic physicians in the United States and serves as associate editor for the journal Molecular Genetics and Metabolism. Dr. Vockley was recognized in 2002 as the Research Educator of the Year while at the Mayo Clinic. At the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Vockley teaches in both the Medical School and Graduate School of Public Health and has mentored numerous PhD candidates, postdoctoral fellows, and undergraduates in their research. He has received his undergraduate degree at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and received his degree in medicine and genetics from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He completed his pediatric residency at the University of Colorado Health Science Center and his postdoctoral fellowship in human genetics and pediatrics at Yale University School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut. Before assuming his current position in Pittsburgh and becoming a co-chair of INFORM, Dr. Vockley was chair of medical genetics in the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Vockley. Thanks, Carol, <clears throat> and thanks everybody for joining uh, for this uh, webinar series. I hope you find it helpful. I, I, uh, I recognize that many of you are used to turning to Mito Action uh, to learn about uh, inborn errors of the respiratory chain, which many people abbreviate to call mitochondrial disease. Uh, and uh, I've, I've, uh, I've advocated for many years uh, that, that uh, we, we really ought to be considering uh, fatty acid oxidation uh, disorders as part and parcel of those conditions. And, and so um, one of the titles of today's talk is Fatty Acid Oxidation Dis Disorders, the Other Energy Diseases. And I think you'll see why 
uh, I, I refer to them that as, as that as, as, we, as we go forward. What I'll be talking about today is, is, is uh, a little bit of bare bones basic science that will help you understand why these two disorder, uh, or, um, uh, metabolic pathways are so closely linked and why the disorders um, uh, share a, a lot of things in common. Um, but then I'm going to transition over to really talking uh, more uh, about novel therapies that we've been working on here in Pittsburgh and with my group um, to treat inborn errors of fatty acid oxidation and how we can use um, studies on samples of, uh, from, from uh, patient-derived uh, materials uh, to really develop a personalized medicine approach uh, to under, for the best, uh, to identify the best therapy going forward for any one individual uh, as opposed to just trying to uh, do it by uh, trial and error. Um, these are my disclosures. I, I have research funding from a, a number of, of uh, sources and consult for some pharmaceutical industries. Um, I'm going to go way back to um, what I gather is now covered in high school biology. Back when I was in college, it was, it was freshman biology. I mean, that's the talk about the central dogma, how proteins are made, uh, because this impacts very much how we think about approaching the therapy of these disorders. Um, first of all, our genetic information is carried on our DNA. The DNA um, is, is, uh, is what makes up our genes, and we get our genes from our parents and pass them on to our kids. Um, the, 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 the DNA inside our cells is mostly in the nucleus. For those of you who know about the mitochondria, know there's a little tiny piece of uh, DNA uh, in, inside the mitochondria. But most of the genes and all of them for fatty acid oxidation disorders uh, are encoded in the, the, the nucleus, the, the, the rear of the cell. Um, those um, genes are lined up on the, on the, 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 the chromosomes. And when they go to be used um, for making uh, proteins, they undergo a process um, that is defined by uh, the central dogma. Uh, basically, what that says is that DNA, um, which is replicating so that every cell is always getting a fresh copy of the DNA when, when it divides, um, uh, but, but to make uh, proteins, DNA has to first make a copy of itself into something called RNA. Um, genes and that initial copy of RNA have a whole lot of information um, that is not ultimately used to make the protein uh, called introns. And those introns have a, a function that we won't spend any time talking about. But the exons contain the information um, that is uh, necessary to make the protein. The, these bits of exons um, and, and in, in uh, um, um, the, the genes that we're talking about, there are anywhere between a dozen and two dozen of them, uh, are, are hooked together by a process called splicing. So now you have this piece, which is physically distant from this piece in the, in the, in the genes, um, hooked together. And once you have them all hooked together, uh, they go on to a process called translation, um, which is where um, the um, uh, the, the, the amino acids are hooked together based on the genetic code carried in these exons, originally up here in the genes, and make the protein. If there's a mistake in the gene here, it's carried through in the RNA, leads to um, a mistake in the protein, and you have a genetic disease in whatever uh, gene uh, that happens to be. <clears throat> now, those proteins are ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, are ultimately uh, the, where we um, have to uh, look to see the cause of these disorders. And that's because that's what carries out enzyme uh, or, or energy metabolism. Energy metabolism, as we think about it um, for fatty acid oxidation disorders and the respiratory chain, are linked pathways. Um, they are functionally and physically hooked together inside the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the power cells of the, uh, of the batteries of the cells. Um, and the respiratory chain here, uh, cartooned, um, uh, is the pathway that ultimately makes the, um, the, the fuel of the cell called ATP. However, 
the the energy um, that the or, or the or the fuel that the electron transport chain uses to make ATP comes from fatty acid oxidation here cartoon and another cycle called the TCA cycle. Fatty acid oxidation is broken up into two large groups of, of uh, functions. One for long chain fats, the predominant fats in, uh, in, in, in our diet. Uh, and these are, are um, uh, yeah, comprised of fatty acids that are made up of carbon chains that are for the most part 16 or 18 carbon chains long. There's also a, a medium and short chain pathway that differs by this one set of steps here. For the long chain fats, they can't get into the mitochondria by themselves. So they have to be activated and transported in by this process um, called the carnitine cycle, which includes carnitine palmitoyl transferases one and two, and a protein that connects the two of them, the carnitine acyl carnitine translocase. Once those long chain fats are in the, inside the mitochondria, they undergo a series of four steps um, that start off with um, in, in the, in, in when we're talking about energy metabolism, mostly uh, the, the, the very long chain acyl coa dehydrogenase um, that, that does the first step, and then a protein called the trifunctional protein, which as its name implies, carries out three steps, the next three in fatty acid oxidation. Um, that series of four chemical reactions Re releases a molecule called acetyl-CoA um, and generates two molecules of fuel in the form of, of uh, uh, two different chemicals, something called NADH, another one called FADH, um, that come directly to the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain. This acetyl-CoA enters this TCA cycle or the, tri the, the tricarboxylic acid cycle um, and makes more of the fuel, this NADH and the FADH2, that goes to make ATP. When you have a defect in long chain fatty acid oxidation disorder, this whole pathway is blocked. Um, that's responsible for about a third of the energy that comes from a long chain fat. You also can't make acetyl-CoA, so this whole cycle doesn't work properly, and you lose the other two thirds of energy. If you use the medium or short chain pathway, um, usually defined as, as MCT oil or, or, or eight carbon um, fuel sources, um, you can get, you can bypass this, <coughs> excuse me, but you're starting with 50% of the, of the uh, uh, energy capacity that you can from here. And that is a, that's a problem. Uh, we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. So, this is an important set of, of, of interactions to remember from a clinical standpoint, because many of the disorders of the respiratory chain, of the electron transport chain, have secondary problems in fatty acid oxidation and vice versa. Um, and and, 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 and uh, the, the defects of fatty acid oxidation end up with secondary TCA cycle depletion because you're using it so fast, um, and, and, and so we end up with, with problems with this pathway, and you have to address them all if you're going to try to uh, deal with, with uh, the disorders of, uh, of, of energy metabolism where, wherever they are. This is that mitochondria that I was talking about, the power cell of, 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 uh, of our bodies. Our cells have anywhere from a, a handful to hundreds of thousands of these, um, and, uh, and, and the, the this, this uh, process of getting fats inside the cell um, has to cross this, uh, uh, the, the, the coating of these member of these mitochondria called uh, membranes. Uh, the, the, the outer membrane of the mitochondria um, is this kind of um, uh, simple structure uh, that, that doesn't do very much more from a functional standpoint than protect the mitochondria from the outside environment. Um, uh, uh, but, but this inside membrane is this very complicated looking thing um, here in a high resolution image from an electron microscopy um, and, and here in a 3D representation showing that this is a very, very complicated uh, series of, of, uh, of membranes that have these funny shapes to them. These funny shapes called Christi um, require this membrane to bend 
and to do that, it requires a special um, uh, uh, fatty acid called cardiolipin that we're going to come back to uh, later. If it had the same composition as this membrane, it wouldn't work. And if cardiolipin doesn't work, this is abnormal and uh, it has a tendency uh, to fall apart and you end up with secondary problems. We already, already said um, much of this. This just gives you a nice three-dimensional view of, of, the, of the mitochondria. Uh, and at minus the cardiolipin, you can't make all these bends. Now, over the last uh, dozen years or so, my lab has been involved in trying to characterize the way these pathways interact. Um, and I'm not going to show you a lot of details there, but what I am going to show you is this model that we've generated um, that, that, um, that, that gives the, 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 the key points about how these proteins interact. First of all, um, in, in that original drawing I showed you, the respiratory chain looked like it was one protein lined up after another. It's not really the case. Each of those blobs that were on that cartoon um, are, are composed, composed of dozens of proteins, um, and, and, uh, and they comprise the complexes of the respiratory chain, numbered complexes one through five. Complexes one through four, um, uh, here um, focused on complexes one, three, and four, um, interact in a way that allows them to be most efficient. If you just lined them up in a row, um, they, they wouldn't work very well. Uh, and so they have to be closely aligned for everything to work together. Um, the, the, this has been recognized in the last 15 years or so. So it's a relatively new finding. Um, uh, we have more recently shown that the proteins of fatty acid oxidation also have to interact with, with what we call the respiratory chain super complexes. Here are the trifunctional protein interacting with a piece of complex one. Um, here, VLCAT in this case, interacting with trifunctional protein. And what that does, and here down here, CPP2, is it allows a channel for the fats, the substrates of fatty acid oxidation and energy metabolism um, to go from one, one component to the next component to the next and just pass through it in a very um, efficient way. The other thing that's important um, is, is that, and, and the, I'm sorry, the, the, the uh, the, the energy, this NADH that comes from the trifunctional protein, the complex one of the respiratory chain, uh, you know, comes through directly by, by, by or comes through by direct contact from the, the trifunctional protein to complex one. The FAD that comes from the first step, the acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, or the very long chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, has to get transferred in a little bit more of an indirect path. It goes through one protein called electron transfer flavor protein, interacts with another one called the electron plant transfer flavor protein dehydrogenase, and then from the electron transfer flavor protein dehydrogenase into complex three. Um, and so as it turns out, this ETF dehydrogenase actually physically interacts over here with complex three, um, and the shuttle is this protein ETF back and forth from uh, the respiratory chain or from fatty acid oxidation, the, the, the VL, VLCAT, over here to complex through the respiratory chain. Just if any of you listening have um, uh, a GA2 or multiple acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, those are related to defects here in ETF or ETF dehydrogenase, whether, uh, whereas um, the, the isolated um, uh, defects in a very long chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase, the, the combined defects of the trifunctional protein deficiency or the individual defect of one of the trifunctional protein functions called LCHAD, uh, which is the protein that interacts with complex one. Um, so you can see they all inter they are, 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 are interact uh, in, this, in, this big, um, uh, in this big complex. Now, what are the clinical implications of that? Well, what you can think about it um, is as a house of cards. So if you just pick up a card here, you probably only have a deficiency related to that one defect. Um, however, if you pull a card out of here, pull a card out of here or out of here, um, what you get is the whole house of cards falling apart.
And so um, thinking of these disorders as can be completely separate um, just doesn't make a lot of sense from the, from the physical standpoint of the way mitochondria are organized. And that's one of the reasons why we've been able to now um, make a lot of progress in developing therapies for these disorders as we think about them as complexes, as we think about the necessary interactions that occur uh, for, for, the, for, for um, uh, normal energy metabolism to, uh, to occur. I mentioned this long chain, the long chain fat, 16 carbons, um, uh, which, which is a, a fat called uh, palmitate. And this just shows what it, what, it, what it looks like. And what fatty acid oxidation does is it locks two carbons off at a time. Two, 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 two. Each of those is an acetyl-CoA. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the acyl-CoA dehydrogenases make FAD. The um, L-CHAD makes NADH. And if you add it all up, uh, what you get is eight, 123 molecules of ATP, the cellular fuel, from one molecule of palmitate. It's a very high energy uh, process. And when that breaks, in the long chain fatty acid oxidative defects, you get zero. If C8, um, you can get some of that back, but there's a consequence to that. As I mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about that later. And if you have MCAD deficiency, um, you, you, you do the first few cycles of fatty acid oxidation, um, but you also then end up with a relative um, energy defect. <clears throat> so what does that mean from a practical implication? Well, we talked about um, this knocking out completely the ability to generate FADH, NADH, and acetyl-CoA. Um, if you bring in eight, what C8 does, medium chain triglyceride oil, um, is, it, is it gives you acetyl-CoA through the short chain and medium chain uh, pathways. Well, this allows the CCA cycle to go, but it has to go at, at, at essentially triple speed uh, because not only are you not um, making um, as much acetyl-CoA as you need from fatty at long chain fatty acid oxidation, but you're replacing all these other uh, reducing equivalents. So it runs and it runs and it runs and it runs. But acetyl-CoA is not the only thing that, that um, is necessary here. It's not just two carbon units that you need in the CCA cycle, but you need these three carbon units that make up another critical intermediate called succinyl-CoA and succinate. And if you only feed acetyl-CoA, you only run until you run out of succinate, and then the, the, the cycle stops again. So this is why MCT oil is, is in, 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 uh, in, in long-chain fatty acid oxidation disorders um, hasn't been the, 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 the cure-all that we thought it would be back when these diseases were first uh, studied. Um, so a number of years ago, Dr. Uh, Charles Rowe um, developed a, drug, a, a compound called triheptanoin, which is built off of a C7 fatty acid instead of a C8 fatty acid. You could do the math. If you take two off at a time here, what you get are two C2 molecules, acetyl-CoA, but then you get one C3 molecule, propionyl-CoA, which in turn makes succinyl-CoA and succinate. So this is a much more balanced fuel that goes for the TCA cycle, and in the context of the, um, the fatty acid oxidation disorders, the long-chain fatty acid oxidation disorders, Dr. Rowe uh, initially treated some patients and it seemed to work um, a, a lot better. Um, when, when, uh, when, when Dr. Rowe uh, decided to retire, um, uh, I took over uh, the development of, of, of this compound um, and uh, was, was, was equally convinced that it was working um, in our, in our long-chain fatty acid oxidation. Uh, pathway uh, patients. And uh, uh, because developing these drugs and getting them into FDA approval is a, um, a 10 or a $20 million uh, process, um, which uh, uh, is very hard to get from a group like the NIH, uh, I uh, um, uh, uh, looked for a, additional ways to fund that, uh, that study. Uh, this, uh, so the first thing we did um, uh, was, was uh, I teamed up with Melanie Gillingham at the uh, University of uh, Oregon Health Science Center um, to get a, a, an orphan drug um, grant from the FDA to do this. Now, this was a to, to study this drug. Now, it was a complicated study, and I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about it. But basically, what we did 
was in a double blind fashion, meaning that patients didn't know what they were getting, we didn't know what they were giving them. They either got um, C7 or C8. They were treated with one of those drugs. Um, they came in, we studied them, their energy metabolism at a baseline, and then we gave them their compound. Neither, neither of us knew what it was. They stayed on it for four hours, and that they, or for four months, I'm sorry, then they came back in uh, to be uh, studied again. Um, and what we were able to show um, was that these individuals um, had an increase in their cardiac function. Um, that that, um, that uh, Dr. Gillingham had already shown that individuals uh, who had uh, uh, long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders and took um, MCT oil instead of a, a carbohydrate diet uh, decreased their heart work uh, uh, at, at, at any one stage in exercise. And that if we gave triheptanoin instead of MCT oil, C8, um, that, that that heart rate, that that heart work decreased. Um, it decreased in, in terms of an improved uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, the key uh, um, uh, functional measure that we follow in, in our, in our uh, long chain patients. Um, and uh, these were patients who had normal heart function to start with. So we thought that was pretty good. We, were, we, 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 we knew our patients were at risk for heart disease and this was working to improve the heart rate. Uh, the problem was we really couldn't see very much difference in a four-month uh, study in, in uh, 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 clinical uh, outcome. Most of these patients were stable when they started. Uh, they didn't have very many problems while they were in the four-month uh, uh, period, and so we really couldn't say very much about that. Um, and to do that um, longer trial, um, I, I, uh, I, I teamed up with a company called uh, Ultragenics. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we then did a, a, a longer term trial um, looking at patients who were previously treated with MCT oil and transitioned them over to, over to um, uh, triheptanoin C7. This was not a double blind study. They, everybody was taken off their C7 and everybody was put on the on C8, their MCT, and put on C7. Uh, you can see uh, that of the patients that we, we studied, we studied 27, um, almost everybody had muscle symptoms, a few had some liver problems, and a, and, and a relatively small number of them had uh, cardiac problems. However, uh, the percentage of individuals by history who had cardiac problems uh, was higher. Um, we didn't have anybody who was actively having glucose problems at the time, but about uh, a fifth of them uh, had a history of hypoglycemia. So what did we find? Well, we found um, that, that if we look at any of the, the, the major consequences of, of um, uh, long chain fatty acid oxidation, rhabdomyolysis or muscle breakdown, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, or cardiac events as defined um, by um, uh, cardiac development of cardiomyopathy or worsening of cardiomyopathy. Um, overall, for treatments who were tre uh, patients who were treated for 78 weeks, we reduced the overall incidence of any of these episodes by half. So that was quite a, 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 um, a, a remarkable finding um, and was statistically significant. Um, it worked best to decrease the, the, the hypoglycemic events. And I can tell you that in the, the now 10 to 12 years that I've been working with rhabdomyolysis, uh, I'm sorry, with long chain fatty acid oxidation defects, uh, what what we've um, what I, I have I have never seen a bona fide, uh, well documented hypoglycemic event in one of those patients again. So it's really good for hypoglycemia. And what that's telling us is it's fixing the energy problem, because the body uses the energy from fatty acid oxidation to make glucose when it's fasting uh, or under stress. Uh, the the heart findings were, were, were pretty good as well. Uh, it decreased the number of, of uh, cardiac events by two thirds. So it was less effective in dealing with the muscle problems. It, it decreased them by about a third, um, but it was, it, it, that was clearly the, 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 the least effective uh, problem uh, that, uh, that, that, we, that we, uh, we were able to deal with. Um, it, we just looked in terms of hospitalizations, pretty much the same thing, uh, well, hospitalizations were decreased by half in the treated population compared to the year before they, they started uh, the, the, uh, the oil. Um, very safe uh, for those of you who've used MCT oil, 
C7 does exactly the same thing. Um, uh, for patients who weren't used to it, some of them had some issues with diarrhea, um, but uh, uh, and and uh, and some and some gassiness. But basically, it was exactly the same uh, in in both uh, the double-blind study that Dr. Gillingham and I did, and this study, uh, open-label study with with um, uh, ultragenics. Uh, we we couldn't tell the difference between C7 and and, and C8 from a, a functional standpoint. Um, and and uh, and so this is now um, uh, before the FDA for approval. Um, and and uh, if it's approved, we hope it will be approved. Uh, it will be the first approved medication to treat a long chain fatty acid oxidation defect. I think that's a, a really important milestone in our field. And and uh, and and and, the, and and what I what I hope will be um, the start of, of many more medications to come. The problem with the results that I showed you um, is 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 that uh, it 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 begs the issue if we're fixing the energy problem as 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 demonstrated by the lack of, of subsequent hypoglycemia. Why are the muscles still affected? Um, and 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 so uh, for the last few years uh, in my lab, we've been studying that question. Um, it seems that the muscle problems are to some extent at least divorced. From the from the energy problems, um, and and uh, let's go back to that model that I showed you, uh, and and um, and and I can I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, about about one thing that we think might be going on. So remember our house of cards. You get VLCAT deficiency here. You pull this card out, um, and and this whole complex suddenly becomes less stable. It becomes leaky. What does that mean in the context of energy metabolism? Well, the reaction that the respiratory chain, the electron transfer chain, um, carries out is the same as burning oxygen with a match. You take oxygen, um, and in the context of lighting a match, you get a flame. Why don't we all burn up? Well, because the respiratory chain slows this down and allows it to transfer that energy instead of in one bat, one big burst into a fire, um, into ATP. It actually charges the, the mitochondria, the battery, which in turn is used to, uh, by, by complex five of the respiratory chain to make ATP. But the bottom line is that we're slowly burning oxygen with the respiratory chain. Um, and, and those intermediate steps where from, from oxygen to, in this case, water, um, are, are um, intermediates that are trapped inside this complex. They're never really meant to see the light of day. In respiratory chain defects, where these complexes are, are deficient, or in fatty acid oxidation defects, where we're seeing secondary um, um, uh, instability at this complex, what happens is those, those intermediate oxygen compounds called reactive oxygen species or oxygen radicals can leak out. And that's a disaster as far as the mitochondria occurs. It damages the proteins in the mitochondria. Um, and so you get a feedback that says well, that, 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 that makes the respiratory chain even less efficient. And it damages everything else in the mitochondria. It becomes less stable. Um, it also affects that special lipid called cardiolipin and breaks it up uh, in a way that, that, that it causes those bends in the mitochondrial membrane uh, to, to um, not be able to be formed. And so you get another secondary problem with mitochondrial stability. So this is a bad thing. Um, and one of the long time attempts at trying to treat respiratory chain deficiency have been antioxidants. The problem with the antioxidants that are commercially available um, is that they're no, they don't work very well to get into mitochondria. Um, and in our hands, when we use them to treat cells from patients who have uh, respiratory chain or fatty acid oxidation problems, we see no effect on the accumulation of these reactive oxygen species um, in, in, those, in those cells. Um, so <clears throat> instead, we've taken um, to looking at different kinds of molecules. Um, this is just to show you what, what, what these experiments look like in the laboratory. You don't really need to understand these. But we can look at cells. We usually use fibroblasts. We take a little tiny skin biopsy uh, from, from patients. We grow them up in the laboratory. And we can test cells 
um, the, the, uh, with, with different compounds to see if they, uh, they, they, they uh, improve. And I'm just going to use this as, a, as a, uh, an example. And what I can tell you is that right here in this part of the graph, the, for the most part, the higher your, your energy is, um, the, this is a measurement of oxygen consumption, the ability of the cells uh, to use oxygen, the better off you are. And so this is a, a, a normal cell, from a, a normal, uh, uh, somebody who has normal energy metabolism. Um, and, and we see different cell lines from different patients and this decrease. And you can see that here in this bar graph, a normal one cell line, a different cell line, a different cell line. Um, and, and so we can use this technique to now treat and see if we get an improvement. We can also measure this reactive oxygen directly. Um, here, uh, a, a measurement um, that, that, that shows in one of our patients with, with uh, a VLCAD deficiency, um, the reactive oxygen here is much higher than in our control cell line. So that's a, uh, um, a, a big difference. And here just shown um, uh, for, for, a patient, for cells from a patient with LCAD deficiency. The higher reactive oxygen species here um, than, than, than here in the control cell. And if we stress the cells, um, uh, it, in some cases it makes it worse. Here it doesn't make it worse. Uh, it does, doesn't change it. Uh, um, here we can take glucose, uh, an easy to use fuel that doesn't require fatty acid oxidation. Um, it doesn't make too much difference in this case. Sometimes it makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. But um, now we have uh, a problem. We have the, all of this reactive oxygen species. It's translating um, into respiratory change dysfunction. How can we fix that? Um, well, let's think about it um, uh, uh, a little bit more about what that means in, from, the, from a cellular standpoint and how that might translate into muscle disease. Remember I said we used to think that the muscle problems were all just related to energy. If we fix the muscle, it would get better. Well, it doesn't. Um, what happens? Well, <clears throat> if we use um, a variety of very sensitive techniques to measure um, inflammation in cells, what we see is this. Reactive oxygen species, one of the very well characterized things that it does is it induces inflammation in cells and it induces inflammation in muscles. Um, that's mediated through special molecules called cytokines that signal uh, in the inside cells and in the bloodstream um, what's going on. Do we need to fight infection? Do we need inflammation? Are we, uh, uh, and, and, and if this process goes out of whack, then you have uh, um, inflammation that's causing damage rather than it that is, is, is doing um, uh, what it's supposed to in terms of normal uh, body functions. In this graph here, or this table, what you can see um, is from, uh, uh, from 16 patients who I follow here in, in, in Pittsburgh who have VLCAD deficiency. Anything that's green is normal. Anything that's not green is abnormal. And anything that's red is a big problem. Um, and these are just a, a number of the cytokines, these molecules that, are, that, that accumulate. Um, and, and these are very problematic molecules. They lead to muscle inflammation. Um, and so um, the, the, the half of these patients were on MCT oil, half of them were on C8, the, or C7 rather, the, the, the triheptanoin. So it really didn't matter whether we fixed their energy. This was still good, this inflammation was still going on. That probably has to do with the fact that the the, the long chain chemicals that back up behind this block um, uh, are, are the, the body uses um, as signaling molecules. And so you have this flood of signaling that says start inflammation um, that we have, to, we have to somehow cool down. Um, well, uh, in, in collaboration with a, a medicinal chemist here at, at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Peter Whipp, um, we've been looking at a, a, a novel a, a series of antioxidants um, that he's developed to see whether they help um, in our case. Um, and and uh, this is that measure of reactive oxygen again. Um, and, and we see the same result here. If we measure it in a, in a control cell line from an individual without any known energy problems compared to an individual who has um, a fatty acid oxidation disorder, reactive oxygen is very high. If we treat 
cells with this compound called JP4. No change in the control cells. They've got normal reactive oxygen to start with. But look at this difference in the cells from the patient with fatty acid oxidation defects. Dramatic decrease, almost down to normal levels. Um, and, and so um, uh, that, that, that uh, is, is, we think is likely to translate into a big improvement in the inflammation in, in these cells. And we hope uh, is the answer to the rhabdomyolysis that's still going on in our patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, oh, this is the, the one that I showed before, so I'm not going to, uh, 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 it, 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 it works for some patients with PLCAD deficiency, but not all. It works for some patients with trifunctional protein, but not all. It works for some patients with isolated LCAD, but not all. And that's why uh, I, I started this talk off by saying uh, that, that, that we're now getting to a point of, of thinking about personalized medicine. The idea that, that, that we can take some lab tests that are going to identify which cells or which treatments might be better for you as compared to somebody else who has exactly the same disease, but, a, but, a, but a, either a different mutation in the gene or something else about their cells um, that's, that's, uh, that's different. So we're working on um, trying to identify someone who's interested in helping us move this, this uh, molecule forward in clinical trials. So far, we don't have any takers, but I'm really persistent. Um, it took me four years to find somebody to work on triheptanoin. We'll find somebody to work on this new molecule, uh, JP4. I'm gonna shift gears now to talk about a different effect and a different possibility for treatment. Going back to our house of cards, um, if that house of cards um, is falling down, if we can stabilize the house of cards, uh, we might be able to improve the secondary dysfunction in the, in the, in, in the, that we get in our patients, even if the primary defect isn't changed at all. Um, and, and so one of the ways that we're doing that um, is by trying to just identify molecules uh, randomly that'll, that'll stabilize the proteins. Um, but we're also taking advantage of a trick um, that, that, that's, uh, uh, in, is, is so, at first sounds a little counterintuitive. If we block the last step in fatty acid oxidation, it causes everything to back up. Um, and in the context of that complex that, I, that I, 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 I showed you, what that means is that these chemicals are trapped inside there. And that's actually, it turns out, a good thing because those chemicals help stabilize the proteins. Um, and and, uh, and as a result, the complexes uh, can, can be more stable. And we, we, we are, we're, we're now looking at this as a process to treat um, the, the, um, uh, these, these disorders. Um, this is one of the, this is a compound that blocks that uh, uh, end stage in fatty acid oxidation. And what you can see here is the higher up on this line you are, the more protein it means you have. And if we treat patients with increasing amounts of patients, their cells, with increasing amounts of this compound, their protein increases. Here, VLCAD, here, trifunctional protein. Now you can say, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're gonna in inhibit fatty acid oxidation to treat fatty acid oxidation, but you've already got a very, very severe block in fatty acid oxidation because of the defect. This is just a little bit, and it, and it, and it doesn't, um, because these aren't anywhere near as efficient as the mutations in blocking the fatty acid oxidation. And we end up with um, not um, uh, uh, having to worry about that little additional uh, block. Um, we've treated lots of different cell lines now with this uh, compound, um, and and we and we see uh, good effects on a lot, a lot of different compounds. And uh, and once again, we're looking for uh, a, a, an industrial partner to help us uh, with with uh, uh, the expenses involved in bringing this compound into uh, a clinical uh, trial. Another way that we're looking at stabilizing the mitochondria in these complexes is by interacting with this cardiolipin. Um, and, and in addition to making this bend possible in, cardi uh, uh, in, in mitochondria, cardiolipin functions by binding to a lot of these mitochondrial proteins. And, and without that binding, without those lipids there, without the cardiolipin, it, they, they, they're not as stable. 
Now, there's a, a, a medication that's being used in uh, disorders right now under study called elamipertide. That drug binds to cardiolipin in, and, and it stabilizes it. So in patients with respiratory chain deficiencies, the, the idea is that by stabilizing the cardiolipin, it will um, uh, uh, help, help stabilize this compound, uh, these complexes that I showed you, and maybe improve their, their, their function. Well, what if you don't have a defect in the respiratory chain? Wouldn't this be even better? We think yes. Um, if you're inducing a problem with the respiratory chain, and now you can stabilize it, you don't have the primary defect in the, in the respiratory chain. You don't have that genetic problem, and it can work just fine. So we can improve energy function in, our, in, in cells from patients with fatty acid oxidation by using this compound. And here's what this looks like. So this is a, a, a cell uh, from a patient with LCHAD deficiency. This is that reactive oxygen species. You can see that it's very much higher um, in the patient with, uh, rest, in, with, with LCHAD deficiency. Um, and when we treat it with this cardiolipin binding peptide, the thing that stabilizes the cardiolipin, very, very dramatic effect. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it essentially normalizes uh, in, in, this, in this one cell line uh, the reactive oxygen species. We've also shown that that translates into improvement in fatty acid oxidation function and ATP production, the, 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 the cellular fuel. Um, so another way of going after this, and, and we can treat these cells uh, in, in the lab and we can test in, in, uh, uh, in, in combination or individually and find out what's going to work for any one cell. A recurrent theme, we're looking for somebody now to help us um, uh, do the clinical trials and, and finance those, uh, those, uh, those studies. Going back to our, our, our central dogma, if you can make more of the messenger RNA that ultimately makes protein, if your protein has just a little bit of function and we make a lot more of it, you end up with more function. And so, um, there are a series of molecule called, molecules called transcriptional activators that can do just that. They make the gene, they, they, they turn on the genes, um, and, and if the, uh, we make more RNA, if that protein is active, you can get more function. Um, some of you may have heard of a molecule called bezafibrate. That's something that's been proposed to be used in fatty acid oxidation disorders, but when it's been tested in cells and patients, um, it, hasn't, it hasn't worked very well. Um, we're using a family of molecules now that are much more potent than that one um, that, that, that um, uh, we think are going to end up being better. They increase fatty acid oxidation proteins, they increase respiratory chain proteins, and they increase an, antioxidation, an antioxidant pa uh, pathway um, that's unique to the mitochondria uh, and so may have a beneficial secondary effect on reducing those, uh, those, uh, that inflammation that we mentioned. Um, and um, here, just to show you our, our oops, go backwards, um, one, one set of experiments with, uh, with one cell line. Um, if we treat um, with, with one of these um, uh, activators, we increase the messenger RNA from VLCAD, we increase the number of protein, the amount of protein, um, we increase the activity that we can measure in cells, and we can increase the amount of fat that that cell can metabolize. So it does everything we want to do um, in, in patients with, uh, respiratory, uh, with fatty acid oxidation defects. And um, uh, it, 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 it also improves their respiratory chain function uh, using that set of uh, measurements that, I, that I, uh, I mentioned before. We have found a partner to take, get this in the clinical trial. So you might have heard of, of the Reneo trial, R-E-N-E-O, that's the company. Um, that, that, that has one of these PPAR delta agonists, the transcriptional activist, um, and we have a phase one trial going on now uh, where three patients, I think, have been treated, um, and we're getting ready to expand that. They also have a trial right now, it's only going on in England, um, but uh, uh, to, to look at patients with respiratory chain deficiency. Um, so this is, a, this, this is likely to be a, 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 a double dipping molecule that will help both primary respiratory chain deficiency and secondary respiratory chain deficiency, or at least we hope it will help. Um, what if we gave you more mRNA? Well, we can do that. There's a company called Moderna that makes therapeutic RNAs. 
um, and they made a, a VLCAD mRNA. Um, and when we give that to cells or we inject that into mouse models of, of uh, very long chain uh, acyl-CoA hydrogenase deficiency, we get a hundredfold activation of VLCAD activity. Here you can see the knock from, from the knockout mouse, um, no VLCAD activity uh, or protein. From a normal mouse, you can see what the normal level is, and here you can see um, uh, that, that we're not quite um, up to normal levels, but a lot. Um, and uh, uh, this company has a clinical trial going on right now start to treat not uh, fatty acid oxidation disorders, but propionic and methylmalonic acidemias um, that many of you may be familiar with because of our, our longtime association as a fatty acid oxidation support group with the Organic Acidemia Society. Um, and and, uh, and, and uh, it's not clear whether this will ultimately be a viable therapy for, for VLCAD deficiency, um, but it does prove the point that if you give more enzyme, uh, if you give more, if you can make more message, you can, you can make, uh, make more protein. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, switch diseases for, for, for the last couple of minutes here. Um, and and uh, um, for, for those of you who are, are uh, with, with MCAD deficiency, um, who are thinking, well, what about us? Um, well, it turns out we've already got a drug that can treat you. Um, there is uh, the com uh, a common change, a common mutation that accounts for about 90% of the of the mutations that we find in individuals uh, in the U.S. and, and, and Europe, uh, especially uh, with MCAD deficiency, and this this is something called this is the, the amino acid that it changes, and it turns out um, that that um, it, the, 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 that if you can this enzyme when the it's it's made go back to that central dog where the gene makes the message the message makes the protein but the protein can't fold up properly to be functional. And if that happens, it gets recycled very quickly by the body because those unfolded proteins uh, uh, hanging around in the cell are, 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 uh, induce a lot of bad things to happen. Well, what if we could, we could uh, convince that unfolded protein uh, to fold properly? Well, we can. We can use a drug called phenylbutyrate um, uh, to, to 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 um, uh, it, it 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 binds to MCAD. The MCAD um, it stabilizes this 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 uh, the mutant MCAD protein. And what you can see here is if we treat uh, cells again from patients with MCAD deficiency, you see uh, very little MCAD activity before we treat, and and a thousand fold, two thousand fold um, increase in patients. Uh, treated with this drug. Um, we have uh, done a first uh, very small uh, clinical trial, um, and when we look at the biomarkers that accumulate in the urine of patients with MCAD deficiency under stress, um, here, fasting. If we treat them, um, if we don't treat them and they fast, they have um, an increased level in these biomarkers. If we treat them and they fast, those markers drop. Um, and, uh, and, and and so we're, we're, uh, while I was able to convince someone to help us do this, uh, this, this first uh, uh, set of uh, clinical trials, um, that company lost interest, and we're now uh, back out on the on the stump, uh, uh, trying to trying to get a, a, um, a company that's uh, interested in helping us uh, move this uh, move this forward. <clears throat> so the bottom line here um, is that. Uh, for a long time, all we had to offer patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders was an attempt at dietary management. Uh, cut, your, cut, cut out the fats that, that, uh, that you can't metabolize. And it just doesn't work very well. Um, but but um, we've, we've moved uh, now to a phase where because of improvements in technology, improvements in our ability to uh, develop uh, compounds uh, based on our understanding of this whole model of complex instead of simple proteins, uh, we've, we've now identified multiple pathways um, to therapies, um, and, and uh, hopefully that first therapy will be, will be approved later this year or early tomorrow or early next year. 
um, and, and we'll be moving forward on all these other um, uh, uh, potential therapies in, in the coming years. And I think that the, 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 um, the, the, the future looks very bright. Um, it, it, it may take five years, it may take 10 years, uh, but we're going to have a much larger armamentarium to treat fatty acid oxidation disorders um, in, in that time frame um, than, than we've had. Um, and I should mention, going back to this idea that all these energy pathways um, are, are, are interrelated, that uh, some or, or many of these therapies may well also work in the respiratory chain deficiencies. Um, so it, 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 it both uh, lends uh, a, a, a lot of credence to the, to the uh, marriage of fatty acid oxidation disorders and, and respiratory chain deficiencies uh, through mito action um, and, and, uh, and, and, and says we need to keep collaborating together to look at these, these, uh, these disorders uh, and, and um, recognize that what might treat one uh, group of disorders could very well um, uh, uh, help uh, treat the others. I'm going to stop there. Uh, I acknowledge some of my collaborators uh, here at, at uh, um, the, the um, University of Pittsburgh and Melanie Gillingham uh, in Oregon. Um, and um, thank you for uh, listening. This is our, our lovely pediatric campus in, in, in Pittsburgh, the uh, UPMC uh, Children's Hospital. And uh, I guess I don't have my, my uh, uh, I'm ready for questions slide in there, but I'm ready for questions. Uh, so if there are any, I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, answer them. All right, Dr. Vockley, thank you so much. This was exciting and it looks like there's lots of new research and treatments on the horizon. So that's all really good news. So I have quite a few questions and they're all related to the car low carnitine levels. Oh. Um, so can you, and, and all from different people, ironically. So can you, the first question is, can you tell us a bit about what causes carnitine deficiencies? Sure, and I'll and I'll even I'll even anticipate the next question is is should we treat it? Um, should we give you carnitine, which is which is quite a, a controversial area right now. Um, the, the 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 part of the fatty acid oxidation cycle, that carnitine cycle, that requires getting the fat from outside the mitochondria into the mitochondria, requires hooking the fat up to carnitine. If in turn, and then it releases it into the mitochondria and it recycles the carnitine. However, if, the, if those, those um, fat molecules inside the mitochondria aren't burned properly, they hook right back up to the carnitine and get exported back out into the cell. The cell kicks them out into the bloodstream and you pee it out into, in the, through the kidneys. And so what you have is a loss of carnitine. Um, the body can only make about half of its necessary carnitine under normal circumstances. Uh, the rest we rely on our diet, and, and so if you if you are constantly losing carnitine, um, it, it eventually leads to a carnitine um, deficiency. Um, what's the impact of that? Well, we don't really know. Uh, we know that if you have carnitine transporter deficiency, one of the fatty acid oxidation disorders, you have very very weak muscles and you have a very weak heart, um, or at least in its most severe form. And if we give you carnitine back, those get better. So initially we thought if you had a low carnitine and one of these other fatty acid oxidation disorders, that giving you carnitine would help. Well, there's no evidence that that's true. Um, and even more so, individuals who are carriers for the carnitine transporter deficiency, parents of kids, um, we know that their carnitine levels are in the same level as most of our patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders and not being treated with carnitine. If those parents are completely normal, they have no symptoms. So do we really need to replace the carnitine if your free carnitine is in the same level as somebody who we know doesn't have symptoms? Um, there, there is um, uh, some concern that, that, that providing more carnitine will allow more of these chemicals that, that back up the acyl carnitines um, to accumulate in blood. And there are some really, really old, really, really indirect data that says that those long chain acyl carnitines can irritate the heart and cause arrhythmias. That has never been demonstrated to be the case in patients. Um, arrhythmias 
are common in cardiomyopathy. And cardiomyopathy is common in fatty acid oxidation disorders. Therefore, we expect we are going to see arrhythmias in patients with fatty acid oxidation disorder. No one has ever shown that giving carnitine makes any difference in that process. And so I take a very practical approach to treating um, uh, carnitine deficiency in, in, in my patients. If your carnitine, free carnitine level is, up, uh, is, is, is more than the 10 or 15 that we see in carriers for carnitine transporter deficiency, I tend not to use it. Or if you don't have any evidence of muscle weakness, I tend not to use it. If your free carnitine is really low, and by really low, I mean less than 10, single digits, um, I tend to give a little bit with the hope that if you have a little bit of enzyme activity and we give you carnitine, whatever is there will work better. At this point, it, there, there's, there's, there's no good evidence one way or another to, to, to show that that works. Um, for you MCATers out there, um, your, car, your carnitine levels will inevitably be low and it has never been shown that it makes any difference. And I don't treat MCAT deficiency um, with carnitine regardless of the carnitine level. And to get around worrying about it, I've stopped even checking it. So I don't even care what your carnitine level is. As long as you don't have show any signs of muscle weakness, you've got enough. Okay, great. Thank you for that, that answer. I think that took care of a couple of the different ones that came in related to carnitine deficiency. So another question that just came in says, is there a connection between FAODs and bad cholesterol numbers? Um, not directly. Uh, we, 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 um, we often see the HDL levels, the good cholesterol levels being low in our patients. Um, but I, 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 we, I, I also think that that's not because of the fat, directly because of the fatty acid oxidation defect per se, um, but that it, it's probably related to exercise intolerance. Remember to increase your HDL, you exercise. And, and if you have a, a muscle disorder, you just can't exercise that much. Um, our patients with long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders are on incredibly low fat diets relative to the general population. And their HDL levels are still low. So I don't think that's a, that's a, that's a problem. Um, the flip side of the HDL being low is that sometimes the bad cholesterol, the LDL low, is, uh, the LDL is higher um, uh, as, 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 and uh, they, they, they tend to go in opposite directions. No um, direct, ev no evidence that there's a direct effect of the fatty acid oxidation on the, the um, uh, LDL levels, and, and, and I go back to my, my, my last statement, which is people on low-fat diets um, are, are, um, uh, should, should have low LDLs, if, if, if anything, and, and we just don't see much, of the, much effect on, on, uh, on, on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the LDL directly. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Next question. Has TMZ stabilization been helpful in LCHAD? Also, since the slide shows its stabilization in VLCAD. It has in cells from patients with LCHAD deficiency. That's as much as I can tell you because we haven't tried it in any patients, either, either VLCAD or LCHAD. Um, and, uh, and, and we would certainly like to do the clinical trial that, um, uh, to, to, to see how that looks. The one thing I'll mention is that in the in the context of um, the, the transcriptional activators, the, the PCAR Delta uh, drugs, um, when we treat cells with both the PCAR Delta drug and TMZ, improves it by even more, which is not surprising because if you make more of an enzyme and you can stabilize it, then you're gonna get a synergistic effect for the two drugs. So I'm thinking that those two drugs might best work together as opposed to being individual. Um, but from the standpoint of the, um, uh, the clinical trial, uh, we, we would have to prove that one works first before we could use it in combination with something else. Okay, great. So it is just after one o'clock. So we're going to take one last question. Is there a connection with false positives of trisomy 21 and a short umbilical cord with LCHAD? The short answer is no. Um, uh, the the L, L chat is not on the chromosome 21. Um, 
there and, and and so there's 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 no no direct relationship with that now i will use my uh an, uh, an analogy here um to 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 um maybe answer that question uh uh, a little bit more directly. There's nothing that says once you have LCHAD or trisomy 21 that you can't have something else. Um, think about it this way. If you have a cold, walk out on the street, you still could be hit by a bus. Um, it doesn't say that the cold caused you to be hit by a bus. Plus, of course, maybe you were blowing your nose and you weren't paying attention. Um, so um, once you have one thing, you have exactly the same risk to have anything else as anybody else in the general population. So if you have LCHAD, your risk of having trisomy 21 or uh, uh, is, 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 is no different than anyone else in the general population. So if the question is, you, you have a child with both, it's coincidence is the, is, the, is the bottom line. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, I would like to thank you, Dr. Vakali, for taking the time to share with us today. This has been great information. And as I said before, the, the studies and the treatments that are on the horizon really is exciting for this community. And we look forward to hearing more from you um, and inform about all that you're doing and the studies you're involved in. Um, so I, I thank you so much for your time today. Um, just all, you know, again, want to remind everybody today's presentation is recorded and it will be posted on the Mito Action website um, by the end of the day tomorrow. I also want to share with you that Mito Action, along with Dr. Vakli and the Inform Network, will be hosting a live patient event on November 2nd in Pittsburgh um, at the Children's Hospital in the Rangos Auditorium. Um, so we encourage everybody to join us. The event will take place from 10 to 2 p.m. on Saturday, and it is there's no cost to to come and join the event. And we'll hear Dr. Vakli speak again. You'll get a chance to ask some questions. Um, and also it's a great opportunity to network with other families. So I would really encourage anybody that's in the Pittsburgh area, if you're interested, we'd love to have you join. You can find more information about the Patient Education Forum with Dr. Vakli on the Mito Action website at mitoaction.org or feel free to email us at info at mitoaction.org. So if, I, if, I, if I might uh, just to, uh, uh, say that, that um, uh, uh, in the, the informed families, uh, the, the family uh, support uh, part of our informed network, um, will be uh, working with the Organic Acidemia Society uh, again um, uh, it, it, it for, for a um, uh, family support group meeting uh, next summer that will also be in, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and we're, we're keeping this going in the tradition of the family, uh, the, the fatty acid uh, oxidation family support group uh, that has uh, traditionally partnered with, uh, with the uh, OAA and uh, putting on that, uh, that uh, program. Yes, absolutely. Mito Action looks forward to participating in that program along with INFORM. So that we'll keep okay. informed with um, more information about that event that will be next summer in Pittsburgh. So thank you, Dr. Vakli, for, for sharing that with everybody. All righty. So thanks everyone for joining us. We appreciate it. And uh, also don't forget, you can find the presentation on the website. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to continue to email them to us. And we look forward to talking with you soon. Take care, everybody.